jump on the call today. Before I introduce Jim, I'd just like to ask Andy Edmund, are you on the line? Do you have any comments or announcements you'd like to make about the call? Yeah. Hey, thank you, John. Just uh, two. Um, the first one is I'm at the uh, I'm in Kansas City at the first Gozar uh, Science Workshop that's designed for the students and the does. Uh, it's the first one, so there's a few little rough spots, but in general, it's, it's off to a really good start. And so everybody now should be signed up uh, for a one-week workshop between now and the middle of March. Uh, just a couple quick reminders about those are the current launch is now anticipated for this Saturday. Um, and I sent out some links earlier for those of you who want to watch it on NASA TV. Um, you can watch the launch live. Also, um, those are uh, the training is available, and there'll be a kickoff uh, once the spacecraft is 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 successfully launched from uh, Louis. But but people can get started with training anytime now. There's about 25 hours of training we're expecting the forecasters to get through between now and uh, um, sometime. I think the due date's going to be probably about April or May of next year. Uh, the other reminder, real quickly, is I am trying to organize a West Region Studio workshop. We have a tentative date for the week of uh, April 17th. We're working with admin to to formalize the contract. And as soon as I have that done, I'll I'll get an email out to everybody. And that's it for announcements. Are there any questions? All right, back to you, John. Thank you. Thanks for the update, Sandy. So uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce my former graduate advisor from the University of Utah, Jim Steinberg. He is um, in the building today here at Western Region for a presentation on some of the model verification work that he and his group at the University of Utah have been doing. We also have one of his students, Tom Gowan, is here, and he'll also be doing a, a presentation along those lines after Jim speaks for a little bit. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jim. All right, great. Thanks, John, and thanks, everybody, for joining in today. I wanted to share some of the... I wanted to share some of the model validation results that we uh, we have been, been processing and doing over the last several months. I'll be talking about the guest precipitation forecast, and Tom will be talking about uh, a wider suite of uh, model forecasts for the short range. Uh, the work I'll be presenting today was done by Lyndon Lewis, who is a graduate student at the, the University of Utah, uh, as well as uh, Trevor Alcott and John uh, Rutz, and supported by CSTAR. We do have a paper that we just submitted to Weather and Forecasting on this that John will be able to maybe uh, share with everybody after the, after the talk. So I think everybody knows what we're up against in using this medium range forecast guidance. It's, it's fairly low resolution, and of course, we're dealing with precipitation in the West that's much uh, much higher uh, in resolution, has a lot more detail. The approach we're taking is similar to what uh, many of you maybe are doing in your offices. Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're taking uh, the prism precipitation climatology. We actually interpolate that to uh, any given day of the year, and then we smooth that back to a, to a spatial resolution that's consistent with the guest grid. And based on the ratio of those two, um, two fields, we get a downscaling ratio. That downscaling ratio has been applied to the guest precipitation forecast to give us a downscaled uh, QPF product. Um, and we're using right now, we're doing an approach. Uh, I know in West, in regions, some people are using uh, grid averaging to do the smoothing, averaging over a particular area. Right now, we're using a, a Gaussian filter with a sigma set to a half degree because we're using the one degree guest grids. We actually found running through everything that that actually gave us the best bias scores. So that's why we're, we're using that. That approach is similar to what WPC does as I understand it. We're going to be validating with uh, snow petal observations. And I'll talk about those in just a minute. A little background on what we're doing. The guest has gone through some changes last winter on December 2nd. It was upgraded. We actually are validating the current operational version of the guests. And NSEP provided us with reforecasts um, for a um, two years prior to last winter, and then the part of last uh, winter that we didn't have data for. So we're doing the cool season, 1 October, 31 March, 2013-14, 2014-15, 2015-16. And this is the operational version as of the 2nd of December, and I don't think they've made any substantive changes to it since. Um, 
The models right now, the guess is at around effective resolution of 55 kilometers, but we're using output on a one-by-one-degree grid because that's all they had available for the reforecast. I think it might be available on a half-degree grid now. Um, we're validating the zero-z runs only, and for the purposes of this discussion, uh, we have the 12-hour offset to describe day one, for example, day two, and that sort of thing. Snowfall observations, I think a lot of you are ex ex have experience with that, but there are some issues that we have to deal with. One is it's only a one-tenth of an inch uh, data resolution. There's a lot of diurnal fluctuations. There's a lot of messy data in it. Um, we're using only 24-hour accumulations. We're not using the pillow data. We're using only the gauge data, so undercatch could be an issue. We've done a lot of quality control of the data and smoothing to get a, a reasonable uh, idea of what the observations are doing. Quick comment on, on validation. As uh, the famous line goes, there's three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. I guess there's a fourth if you add model validation to it. One of the many issues we come into is that the climatology of the Western United States is highly varied. Uh, we're going to be looking at upper quartile precipitation events at each uh, snowfall site. This is the top 25% of all precipitation days. These, and the results are very similar if you look at top decile or top 10% events. But we're using upper quartile, so the results are statistically significant. Now, there's a large number of these upper quartile events in the Pacific Northwest. There's many, many, many precipitation days. So when you look at the top 25, there's a large number of those. Um, there's also a pretty large number of upper quartile events, for example, in the Colorado Rockies. They have a lot of precipitation days, but they're smaller amounts. Uh, or if you go down to Arizona, you have a lot fewer upper quartile events. When you get them, they tend to be pretty large. So this is a very diverse precipitation climatology. We will break things down regionally some to deal with this. I just wanted to bring that up. All right, so first and foremost, let's talk about how GEFs reproduces the, the climate of the Western United States. So on the left-hand side here, this is the control. We're going to be looking at day one here to start, so before there's a lot of error growth, just see how well does GEFs reproduce the climate of the Western United States. This is the GEFs one control mean precip. On the right, or in the middle, is the CPC mean daily precipitation, and then the bias ratio is on the right. So this is the ratio of what the GEFs produces to what the CPC produces. We're using the CPC analysis to take advantage a little bit of the lower resolution because we want to look at some regional differences to start rather than what we get at real high resolution. Story here, of course, no surprises, tends to be dry over major mountain barriers and relatively wet over lowland regions and downstream of those barriers. Uh, a quick uh, comment that all the other guest members produce exhibit similar characteristics, so we're not going to be presenting all the guest members, and that there's a slight drying trend in the guests with increasing projection, but it's pretty small and not all that significant. The other comment is that there is some weirdness in here if you get down to gory details. If we zoom in here to northeastern Utah where the Uinta Mountains are, and usually there's a, in the prism data, you can see nice maximum precipitation there. There's a huge uh, over forecast problem based on this comparison, but the problem is the CPC analysis doesn't actually know that the Uintas are even there. So quick comment that anytime you do validation relative to analyses, you're also letting the analysis biases go in there. All right, so now looking at, at snowtail, again, control, day one, mean daily precipitation, snowtail, and then the bias ratio. This is the main figure to focus on. No surprise here, we have an underprediction of the mean daily precipitation at most sites, but not all. There are a few snowtail sites where the guest precip works out okay. I don't know if there's necessarily a strong um, indicator of exactly what those sites are, but some of them, like the one up here in the uh, Olympics, is a snow pelt site that's on the downstream side of the Olympics. It's a little bit in the rain shadow, and it works out that the guest precip isn't too bad for that particular site. Okay, now breaking it down and looking at, by, at um, kind of the characteristics of the guests by model or by event size or daily precip size, I should say, compared to what snow pelt does. So the key line here is this dash line. And the one, the one line means that the guest produces the same number of events as observed. And if the dash line is below that line, it means it produces fewer events than observed. So a key indicator here when we look at the whole West United States is it's about event size of 0.3 inches that you start to see a major under forecast uh, a problem with event frequency. That only increases as the event size gets larger. So that's for the whole uh, West United States. We're going to break it down regionally, looking at what we'll call Pacific ranges, which is mainly the coastal ranges, the Cascades, and the Sierras, 
and the interior ranges, which is going to be most of Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and a little bit of northern New Mexico. And if we do that, then we see that uh, in the Pacific ranges, kind of the break point, there's a little bit of an over-prediction of event frequency for smaller event sizes less than about 0.7 inches, and an under-prediction once you're above that threshold. And again, it increases as the event size goes up. Interior ranges, you can see a couple things. One is the um, under-prediction problem starts at a lower event size, 0.3 inches, and the severity of the under-prediction is a lot larger. Okay, And we'll see this repeatedly. Folks in the Pacific ranges, you guys have an easier job than the ones over the interior. Okay, looking at um, the downscaled guess now and how the downscaled guess does. Again, now we're looking at the um, snow tail mean daily precip in the middle. On the left is the downscale control from the guess, and the right-hand side is the bias ratio. And you can see with the downscaling, not surprisingly, we do quite a bit better. The mean biases are quite a bit better, but we do see some outliers. We see some tendency even with downscaling that no Yan Rim, the Sierra Nevada are still a little bit of under prediction. Quick comment that there's not a lot of events down here over the last three years, so we're not sure how significant that is overall. And there's a few areas where downscaling gives us a little more precip than we would like. But straight downscaling based on the prism grids, um, this is about what you get. And again, other guest members exhibit similar characteristics, and we do see this slight drying trend with increasing projection. Now, looking at those same plots, you can see that with downscaling, the event frequencies being produced by the guests look, match up pretty well with observed. Over the interior, there's a little bit of a positive bias, meaning that there's a little bit of an overprediction issue that you have over the interior as a whole. Okay, now going on to deterministic performance. So one member of the guests, how well does one member of the guests do? And then we'll look at the probabilistic stuff to, to wrap things up. So I'm just going to use equitable threat scores, although we have a number of other statistics that are uh, in the paper. The left is the basically the control of the guest, control member of the guest, and the right is the downscaled control. So you can see in general there's a shift towards higher, higher equitable threat scores with the downscaling. We'll probably look at that in a little more detail here in just a minute. But certainly downscaling is, is definitely um, doing better. The other thing to notice is how the performance of the model degrades as you move into the interior. The threat scores are generally higher over the Sierra Nevada and over the Cascades. And as you move to the interior, you see the shift towards uh, warmer colors, towards redder colors, indicative of a shift towards lower equitable threat scores. Even with downscaling, you see the same sorts of things, uh, especially as you get into, um, into Colorado. Um, there's a, definitely an interior bias you know, or decline in equitable threat scores as you move to the interior. Okay, now we're breaking it up by, by region. Okay, so the, um, basically the control for the Pacific ranges is this dashed dotted line here, and then the solid one is with downscaling. Over the interior without downscaling, the bottom line here, dashed dotted line, and um, with downscaling is the solid line. These are equitable threat scores as a function of forecast day. So a few things to kind of highlight here. One is that with downscaling, regardless of whether you're over the Pacific or over the interior, you're getting an improvement of scale of about two to two and a half days. Um, the impact is a little bit larger over the interior than it is over the Pacific ranges, okay? Okay, the next thing is with downscaling uh, in the Pacific, um, just to show you that how much better everything is over the Pacific ranges, Downscaling over uh, with the Pacific is the equivalent of downscaling over the control at day one. So it's almost a three-day three, three day difference. So downscaled forecasts at day four of the Pacific are the equivalent of the downscaled forecasts at day one over the interior. Okay. Control is even worse. <laughs> so if you're it's really quite remarkable, the, the decline in skill. Okay. Probabilistic uh, performance. Going to be using uh, reliability diagrams for this. I'm just going to show two days. One is day one, and the other is day five. And I'm showing day one for a couple of reasons. I think everybody's aware that the uh, ensembles in general tend to be um, under dispersive, or if you want to think of it another way, overconfident. And that's especially true uh, at day one. This inset figure here is kind of a sharpness diagram showing the frequency that um, certain probabilities are, are predicted, one being 100%, zero being um, 0%, okay? And this is for upper quartile events. 
smiley face pattern that you see here indicates that the guest very frequently has got a 100% chance of an upper quartile event or a 0% chance of one. Um, it's very, very sharp like that, and in general, it's a sign of overconfidence. By day five, things get better, okay? So as, as you go forward in time, the, 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 the guest becomes a little less under-dispersive. Um, so forecasts become less confident, or you should say less overconfident maybe, and less categorical, categorical with increasing lead time. And um, downscaling generally increases event uh, likelihood, which is the difference between this red line and the blue line. Okay, the blue line is the downscaling. If we take a look at the reliability diagrams, which is basically a plot of the forecast probability versus the observed frequency, you can see the slope here is less than the one-to-one -one line, which is a sign of overconfidence, okay? So the guest forecasts are really strongly overconfident at day one, and they're more, uh, less overconfident at day five, as this line lines up better with the one-to-one -one line. Okay, so basically the forecasts become more reliable with increasing lead time, but they remain weakly overconfident at day five. So one way to think about that overconfidence is if we take a forecast, say, where there's an 80% chance of an upper quartile event, that's going to verify somewhat slightly less than 70% of the time. So that's what we mean by overconfidence. On the other hand, if we come over here, we look at a low probability forecast, 20% chance, say, of an upper quartile event, that's going to verify roughly 30% of the time. Downscaling really doesn't change at all kind of the reliabilities of, of, the, uh, of the ensemble because all you're doing is shifting everything to higher values. So you can see here that we still have an overconfidence issue um, even out of day five with the downscaling. It's not really changing the, um, the ensemble all that much. Okay, let's see what I want to say here. Uh, oh, one quick comment on this I think is quite important. And these are uh, perspectives on these large event forecasts at day five, okay? And um, if we look in the Pacific ranges now, we've zoomed down into the Pacific region. You can see here that when you get a situation where the GEPS is calling for an upper quartile event with a likelihood of 90 to 100%, so all the members are saying you're going to get an upper quartile event, it's important to keep in mind that that only verifies about 55% of the time. So we don't have enough, say, upper decile or upper one percentile events to know what we get in an extreme event. But we have to be careful when all the ensemble members line up and say a big event's going to happen when you're out at day five, six, or seven. We have to recognize that there's, there can be an overconfidence issue at those time scales. So keep that in mind. All right, so quick summary. Um, on the guest control, and for each individual members as well, no surprise, too dry in the mountains, tendency to be too uh, wet in the valleys and basins, and it under forecast the frequency of, of large events. Uh, downscaling at the, of the guest control at mountain sites generally improves mean daily precipitation, produces better event frequencies, um, although it produces a slight over prediction of event frequencies over the interior, although this could could reflect undercatch a little bit too. Um, probabilistic verification reflects these model biases, but it also reflects the characteristics of the guest ensemble spread. Okay, and this leads to overconfidence in general, but especially at short ranges when the guest is strongly underdispersed. The downscaling exacerbates the overconfidence in the high probability forecasts a little bit by shifting the reliability diagram downward. Um, and for higher probability forecasts, especially at medium ranges, actual upper quartile and upper decile event frequencies are lower than indicated by the guests and the downscaled guests. So you have to kind of recognize when all the guest forecasts line up, the reality is they don't verify at such a high rate. So with that, I'll, I'll knock off and take questions. Yeah, any questions out there for Jim? Hey, Jim, this is Brett in Riverton. Hey, Brett. Hey, um... Based on the snow tail plots that you showed with the dots and everything, it didn't look like all the snow tails were being used. Did you guys cut some? Yeah, out? yeah, we have to cut about 200 out by quality control for various reasons, uh, and also some of them. There's a few that were put in in the last three years, but um, for the most part, it's quality control issues. Uh, that's talked about in the paper if you want to get into gory details. Okay. I just noticed that there weren't, you didn't have any snow tails plotted for the Bighorn Mountains in, in Wyoming. Yeah, you know, I got to go back and look at that. I thought we had, um, 
I don't remember now. We did a lot of revisions of the quality control for the paper. I thought we had a few of those get in there in the end, but maybe the final comb through those didn't make it through. Apologies. We're sorry to cut out your county war a big part of your county warning area. <laughs> That's okay. I just I just it just kinda stands out when I, I recollect where all the snow tails are in Wyoming. Yeah. Other questions? So, Jim, this is Andy. Um, you know, NSEP right now is undergoing a big internal review, primarily driven by the UMAC. And if you could wave a magic wand, what one or two things do you recommend to try to improve the model forecast in the West? Well, I think that's a tough one. I mean, in, in some respects, when you look at the downscaled event frequencies produced by the guests, it's actually, it actually doesn't look all that bad. Um, I mean, my view is, you know, we need to move as fast as we can to a cloud-resolving ensemble at short range. That would be, um, in my view, the number one priority. Uh, Tom is going to present some results from the NCAR ensemble. It looks pretty good. So that would be the one thing I would probably emphasize. Um, obviously, the, you know, I think the biggest problem with the guests and the GFS is, you know, it, it, they lag behind the EC by a pretty large margin. Uh, we have done a little bit of internal verification of the EC, and it's oh, we're using the Snowtail data now, and it's it's definitely better. And um, I don't know how the SUs feel about it, but my view, looking at the um, the near native resolution guest output on a 13 kilometer grid, is the precip is in it is terrible, and it needs to be improved pretty dramatically. So that would be an area of focus, I think, too. Appreciate it. Thank you. Other questions before moving on? Okay. Well, with that, I'm, this is oh. Sandy. I have one more question. Yeah. So, so, Jim, when you when you take a look at this, how do you characterize the model performance? Is, is it capturing the event, but not the intensity of the precept, or is it just missing the event altogether? Well, what we've been looking at by with our bias statistics kind of gets around the random errors. So it's really, I mean, to me, the gaps under prediction problem is because it just doesn't predict the events at all because of lack of resolution. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, um, but that would be my perspective, is that that grid spacing, it can't get it. Downscaling helps to improve it. But the reason why, for example, the skill scores degrade as you move into the interior is as you move to the interior, you get a lot more whiffs. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of events that are forecast that don't happen, and there's a lot of events that aren't forecast that do happen. Um, and we see that quite a bit here in Utah and I'm sure in other parts of the interior. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, I'm going to let Tom take over now. Hi, everyone. As John said, my name is Tom Gallen. Um, I'm one of Jim Steenberg's students at the University of Utah. And my work has been validating QPF and the NCAR Ensemble and other high-resolution operational models over the western U.S. So a lot of what you'll see here is very similar to the um, plots that Jim just showed, except for um, higher-resolution models and short-range models. So my motivation is that uh, high-resolution ensemble modeling systems attempt to both capture the large spatial variability and quantify the inherent uncertainty of precipitation and complex terrain. And to date, um, to our knowledge, these convection-permitting ensemble modeling systems remain largely untested um, over the complex terrain of the western U.S. And NCAR has been running their experimental NCAR ensemble, and it really serves as an ideal platform um, for a next-generation QPF validation study. And has 10 members at three kilometer grid spaces. So we're going to be, in my uh, validation study, I use the NCAR ensemble. For deterministic purposes, I just use number one. Um, it uses a uh, type of ensemble modeling where each member can be equally likely. Um, I use the HER version one, which just stopped running, but all my results are from the previous cold season. I use the NAM 4 kilometer, NAM 12 kilometer, and the CMWF ensemble. All the models um, use hours forecast 12 to 36 from the 0Z runs, except for the HER, which obviously doesn't go out past 24 hours. So we come. Sorry about that. 
Uh, we combine hours 3 to 15 for the 9Z and 21Z runs. Uh, PRISM data was used to reveal some of the model climatologies. Uh, it's developed by the PRISM Climate Group at Oregon State University. Uh, we used four kilometer gridded point data, which were developed in 12Z to 12Z. Um, and on the right just shows the total precipitation that fell in the past cool season across the Western U.S. Um, as Jim described, uh, the main portion, or most of the observational data I use is snow tail data. Um, it's run by the NRCS, and they only report hourly precipitation to a precision of a tenth of an inch or 2.54 millimeters. Um, we use daily 12Z to 12Z, as Jim said, to minimize the impact um, that the temperature has on expanding and contraction of the gauge, at least to artificial changes. Um, and it was QC, similar to the method in Ceresi uh, at all on Candy 9, but that is described in Wyndham's paper that just came out. Um, so here we see um, event frequency. I described an event as greater than 2.54 millimeters in a day, just to kind of understand the climatology of the Western U.S. And um, it's been shown that differences in climatologies affect model skill. So in areas of the Pacific Northwest, uh, we see that about 80% of days during the previous school season had an event. You know, in Arizona and New Mexico, some regions only around 10% of days had a precipitation event. So considering that there are 163 days in the cool season, that's about 130 precip events in the Cascade and only 20 in Arizona and New Mexico. And Hamill and Juris, uh, 2006, uh, kind of outlines how these differences in climatology affect model skills. Here we look at uh, spatial precipitation bias. Basically, I took total precipitation from each model forecasted during the cool season and divide it by total precipitation um, in the PRISM data sets. Uh, what we see is the best bias scores, meaning close to one or no bias, uh, were in the HER and the NCAL ensemble. And you can also see that the standard deviation of the bias is way less. They generally have a lighter shading, so it's um, whereas in the two NAM models, you can see there's much more vivid colors, meaning that it largely underpredicted or overpredicted regions and it just averaged out to a bias close to one. Um, now looking at the same plot, except for using snow tail data here, uh, the best bias and low spatial variance were in the NCAR ensemble and the NAM 12K. The HER and the NAM 4K exhibit a bit of overprediction. The first glance you can kind of see a, there's a general more greener shading across all the snow tail sites. And one thing to know is that the mean bias is equally weighted among all stations. So stations or precip events in Arizona and New Mexico have a much larger impact on these stores than uh, precip events in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and now this is looking at the same data, except I kind of uh, average it out for each region. We use the regions described in Serenity et al. There's a lot of data in a lot of these um, plots I'm going to show. And I kind of did that on purpose so each uh, region can look at how the models uh, score in their region. So we'll say Jonathan send this out to everyone afterwards. Um, in general, in wetter climates, uh, all the models overpredict. Where in drier climates, the models underpredict. Um, the Anchor Ensemble does notably well in uh, Northwest Wyoming and Utah and in the interior, as well as Colorado. Here we look at total accumulated precipitation for each region. Uh, one thing that sticks out is the four kilometer NAM really over predicts in a lot of the interior. And the NCAR ensemble control the HER as well as the Nantolke do uh, pretty much similarly well in all these regions. Um, here we have uh, these heat maps where we basically bin all the forecasts and observed uh, pairs and we plot them um, in the heat map form. So on the x-axis, we have forecasted event size. On the y-axis, we have the corresponding observed 24-hour event size. And so a model does really well. It looks similar to this high-accuracy example here. Um, the forecasted event size and then the corresponding observed event size would match and follow this one-to-one -one line. Then a low-accuracy model could look similar to this, and there'd be really no one-to-one -one correlation. Look at the NCOM ensemble control. 
you could say that it has high accuracy. It has decent spread, but there's no indication of a bias. Meanwhile, the HERP has much smaller spread, but we do need to remember that we're using hours 3 to 15 from two small ones to the HERP, so it's um, a much shorter time range. And the HERP does exhibit a bit of overprediction. As you can see, a lot more of these event pairs are falling below the line, indicating that more was forecasted than observed. Now for the NAM 4 kilometer, it exhibits really strong overprediction. A lot more of these event pairs are falling below the line for events of all sizes. Now for the 12 kilometer NAM, it does well for smaller events. It generally follows the one-to-one -one line without too much spread. But for larger events, a lot of these pairs fall above this one-to-one -one line, indicating that more was observed than was forecasted. Uh, this plot similar to the one Jim showed. We look at event size frequency bias. Um, the HER, NAM 12K, and NAM, or sorry, the Ancon Solver Control, NAM 4K, and uh, HER all do similarly well. There's this general overprediction with increasing event size. This may be due to the undercatch in the snow tail sites, not totally sure. And then the NAM 12K shows significant underprediction. Um, well, not significant, but it underpredicts um, for these larger event sizes. And snow tail sites, because we're looking at total number of events over the western U.S., snow tail sites in the Pacific Northwest heavily influence these results. So I broke them up into regions. Um, I know there's a lot going on here. It's going to probably won't be able to pick it all up right during this presentation. But in general, the NAM 4K um, produces too many events, too many large events, greater than 30 millimeters. And the Echo Ensemble appears to perform fairly well for events around 30 millimeters. And then, especially in interior regions beyond the event size of 36 millimeters a day, uh, the results are really noisy just because there was so few events and we have a very small sample size. Can I interrupt with a question? Yeah. On the last, <clears throat> on the last slide you showed before that, mm -hmm. it looked like the 12 kilometer dam was actually doing a pretty good job in terms of the bias ratio. It's near one. And then on the next slide, when you break it down by region, it's sort of all over the place. Yeah, so What's your take on it is that that's just an average of it, it really just, just handling these regions differently? Yeah, well, so a couple of things to know is snow tail sites in the Pacific Northwest are really heavily influencing these results. So if we look up here, the NAM actually looks, the, the scale is a bit different. So it, it goes to about down to like 0.8 in this graph. Then the Pacific Northwest, it's actually around there. Just the scale is different, and that has a large impact. So, if, I mean, this plot looks very similar yeah. to the Northwest plot because there's so many precipitation events. And then it's really hard to say. I'm not sure if any of this is too significant in the interior just because there's so few events of that magnitude. Thanks for the clarification. No problem. Um, next, I looked at some verification measures, including bias, hit rate, false alarm rate, probability of false detection. Uh, for bias and hit rate, obviously a score of one is your best score. And for false alarm rate and probability of false detection, sorry, I don't know why that keeps happening. Um, a score of zero is your best score. Uh, one thing to, um, so though I use event percentile thresholds for these instead of event size in millimeters, and this kind of helps um, with allowing station dryer stations to have more of an impact on the scores. If I use just pure millimeters, um, for example, an event size of 50 millimeters or greater, all those events occur in the Pacific Northwest. So we broke it up like that, and we can see that the NAM 4K exhibits that strong overprediction compared to the other models. Meanwhile, the HER and the Encon Thermal Control do fairly well, and the, and the NAM 12K has a bit of underprediction for events of all sizes. And the NAM 4K's overprediction leads it to have a higher hit rate, but also a high false alarm rate and high probability of false detection. The HER, in general, seems to do the best. It has a reasonable bias, fairly strong hit rate, especially for upper quartile events, and then low false alarm rates and probability of false detection. Um, as Jim described, we did echo test scores too. A score of one is a perfect score. A score greater than zero means it's skillful, and a score less than zero means it's unskillful. As expected, the HER gets the best. Um, 
especially for upper quartile events, it does very well. And as I stated before, um, actually, I haven't said this yet, but um, models with high bias generally have higher Excel threat scores. This was shown in a paper by Tom Hamill in 1999. So although the NAM Forte appears to do well, um, subjectively, it likely is not doing this well. The overprediction issues cause it to have a high Excel threat score. And the, another thing to note is that the NCOM ensemble struggles with these small events. Um, next, I broke up spectral threat score into these same uh, regions as described before. In general, in wet climates, um, all the models do better. It's shown up here in the Pacific Northwest. In drier climates, such as Colorado, Northwest Wyoming, and Arizona, New Mexico, the scores are generally lower. And the herd does perform the best in all regions. Now we're looking at echo threat scores by Snowtel site for um, just upper quartile events on the top and upper decile events on the bottom. The HER, as you can see, for upper quartile events has the most red shading among all the sites, and it's the best echo threat score. And the echo ensemble, or I keep asking. Uh, the NAM 12K uh, struggles with upper decile events as well as the echo ensemble control. You can see the more yellow shading across all the snow tile sites for these two models for upper decile events. Um, now on to the probabilistic forecast. We looked at reliability, which is essentially statistical consistency between the predicted probabilities and observed frequencies. Resolution, which is the ability of a model to distinguish some cases under consideration occur with lower or higher frequency than climatology. Um, and then we did Breyer scores, which is a measure of accuracy. Um, zero is a perfect forecast. And then Breyer skill score, which essentially is the Breyer score of the model compared to the Breyer score of climatology. And the score greater than zero, the greater the score is than zero, the better the score is. And if it's less than zero, it has no skill, or in other words, climatology is a better forecast. So these are um, similar plots that Jim was showing. This is just for the NCAR ensemble, um, all 10 members for upper quartile events on the left and upper decile events on the right. Um, it has a bit of that overconfidence issue that Jim was describing, where for when it thinks an event will happen, so it gives a forecast probability of one or saying that all members think it will happen. The event actually only happens at about 85% about of the time. And when they think the event won't happen or it forecasts a 0% chance of the event happening, the event ends up happening um, about 10% of the time. It exhibits this for both upper quartile and upper depth all of us. Next, we broke up the state into two regions. We did an interior region shown in red and a Pacific region shown in blue here. Um, in general, as we've seen with all other of these skill scores, the model is better in the Pacific region. For both upper quartile and upper decile events, the model has uh, lower, sorry about that, lower Breyer scores in the Pacific region and higher Breyer skill scores in the Pacific region. Next, we compared it to the ECMWF ensemble. In green, we're using all 50 members of the ensemble, and in yellow, we're just using 10 random members. Um, the NCAR ensemble is far better than the EC in this regard. Uh, the, Breyer skills, the Breyer scores are way lower in all cases, and the Breyer skill scores are much higher. Next, I focus on events that fall out of the ensemble spread. These are kind of confusing. On the top, we're doing upper quartile events. On the bottom, we're doing upper decile events. Um, on the left, we're doing when the event occurred, so an upper quartile or an upper decile event was observed, but it was not forecasted by any of the ensemble members. So the entire, the entire spread was below the upper quartile and upper decile threshold. And then on the right, we do, this is showing um, when the event did not occur, but the event was forecasted. So the entire spread was above the upper quartile and upper decile event threshold, but the event did not happen. And this is for the NCON ensemble on the left and the European ensemble on the right. 
So what we see is events fall above the spread, most commonly in the interior, so here in Utah and Colorado, as well as here in Nevada. And events fall below the spread, most commonly in the Pacific Northwest coastal ranges, as well as here in Nevada again. And then with the ECMWF Ensemble, because it's such coarse resolution, and there's 50 members, events essentially never fall, sorry about that, events never fall below the spread, but almost half the time, events at almost all locations fall above the spread. This is just showing the same data in a different plot. Um, once again, we see that the Encom Ensemble is the worst in the Sierra Nevada. Um, there's a lot of events to fall above the spread and a lot to fall below the spread. And then looking at the ECMWF Ensemble, um, the scales actually change here. We went zero from 30 for the Encom Ensemble. We're going zero to 60 for 100 events in the ECMWF Ensemble. So about, on average, 50 events or half the events fall above the Ensemble spread for both upper quartile and upper decile events and events almost never fall below the spread, which is what we expect because it's a coarse, non-convection permitting ensemble. So it doesn't pick up on a lot of the orographic effects that are present at these snow tail sites throughout the Western US. So what we found is that the Econ Ensemble controls such a single member performs well. It has great bias scores, moderate to high accuracy, and a decent ability at capturing large events. The HER performs extremely well. It has a very slight overprediction. Um, high accuracy, and it does very well with capturing large events. The NAM 4K performs poorly. It has extremely high bias, which leads to low accuracy, but because of that high bias, it does capture large events. And the NAM 12K does well for small events. as a slight underprediction issue, but it really doesn't capture those large events because it's non-convection permitting and doesn't capture a lot of the orographic effects and convection that take place in these uh, areas of complex terrain. On the probabilistic side, I still have some more work to do here, but the Encon Ensemble appears to pour, perform very well. Um, comparing it to the ECMWF Ensemble, it's, it's much better. Now, future work, if possible, I'd like to add the ECMWF high res in, into my deterministic validation. I'm going to continue probabilistic validation as well as focusing on those events and the characteristics of them that fall outside the ensemble spread. And then possibly I'll downscale the ECMWF ensembles and compare that to the NCR ensemble. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. And apologies to you and those viewing for the PowerPoint having a mind of its own and wanting to skip ahead of time. Are there any questions for Tom on his presentation? Hey, Tom, this is Chris at the Reno Forecast Office. Um, of course, we, we deal with a lot of lee side uh, forecasting issues here, and I was curious if you'd looked at or, or maybe considering for your future work of taking some of the major mountain ranges like the Sierra, the Cascades, and Rockies and, and splitting the verification into windward and lee side. I'd be curious what the results would be of that. Yeah, I actually didn't show this in here, but I've looked at that a little, and it's very hard, unless I'm picking exact individual sites, to determine, like, I've looked at things like the slope of the mountain that the hotel site is located on and things like that, and there's really not much that shows up. I mean, I can dig into looking at specific sites, but it's very hard to use kind of like an algorithm to divide up mountain ranges using terrain because it's just so varied. Sure, understood. Yeah, you probably almost have to go through each snowtail site and assign it a lee side or windward side. Mainly. Yeah, it's really kind of a subjective thing. I've tried many different ways, and nothing really solid shows up. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. This is really good content. I'll have to go through the slides later and truly absorb all of it, so appreciate it. Yeah, there's a lot. I divide up into eight regions, which I knew would be too much, but I figured each forecast office would kind of want to know how the models do in their region. Yeah, I no, appreciate it. It's good stuff. Thanks. Other questions? you go back just a couple slides, Tom, to where you were showing um, for these forecasts? It might have just been one or two more slides back. Yeah, uh, one forward, sorry. <laughs> so on the left there, these are basically showing the number that fall above, where the number of events that fall completely above or below the spread yes. in the car ensemble. It's just, it's just sort of a presentation comment, I guess. But have you thought about creating one graphic which just shows basically 
the sum of those for each, so like the total that fall outside of the spread. It'd be kind of interesting because I get the impression looking at them that it looks like, I mean, the UNT is light up in both as being extremely just, it seems to fall to one side or the other. Yeah, I mean, so this, is here. this is what this shows. It's not divided into mount range. It's using the same regions I used before. Okay. But that's basically what this is showing. Sorry, I kind of went fast through this. But I did occurrences per 100 events in each region. So we can say, that like, in the Sierra Nevada, 25 of 100 events, when it's forecasted to be, or the event happens above the spread, when it's forecasted to be below the spread. Okay. So we looked at 100 events where the model forecasted below the spread, and 25 times it was observed above the spread. Okay. This kind of takes some time to understand. I could I'd make this a little easier to understand. <laughs> a lot of information. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions out there? Hi, Tom. This is Andy in Flagstaff. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? Good. Um, noticing on your plots with the um, ensemble forecasts that are falling above and below the spread that the dots for Arizona and New Mexico disappeared. And I know we certainly observe that down here uh, fairly often, actually. So I'm wondering if that's because maybe we don't observe, we haven't had enough events down here, or if it's for some other reason. Yeah, that is the case. So I only have one season of data right now. And looking at for like upper decile events, since you guys only had 20 precipitation events, that basically comes out to like two upper decile events. <laughs> so like there's really no significance in some of that. Right. Unfortunately, and if you were last year, we did not have that many. So I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I think I set a minimum of 20 upper quartile events. Any other questions out there? Yeah, hey, this is Andy. Hey, this is really nice work, and I really like it. It gives us some insight. So let me ask a, a little bit of a question that's going to put you in a little bit of a difficult spot. What characteristics of the, N, the NCAR ensemble do you believe are making it perform a little bit better? Um. Well, I know that it's it's very similar to the HER. I believe it's based off WERF, um, so I assume that's why it's doing very well. It, it has a bit of a larger spread, as I showed in the deterministic forecast, and that's likely due just because it's an ensemble, so the initial conditions are kind of perturbed a bit. But I think the fact that it's based off WERF is really why it performs so well. So, so I, I know it's difficult to see sort of into the innards of the NCAR ensemble, but so you, you believe that when they run a number of members, you're, you're seeing a little better spread? Yeah, well, I guess what I mean by spread is, I don't know if I'm using the right word here, but um, for a single member, like as you see in this plot, there's a bit more... Um, there's less bias, but there's more times when it kind of overpredicts or underpredicts, and that's because it's an ensemble. So it's the herd given better initial conditions, whereas the Encore ensemble, each member is perturbed a bit. So I also I have to think about that a bit more how I'm describing that. But the herd does better because just using a better idea of what we think the real state of the atmosphere is, whereas each member of the Encore ensemble is perturbed a bit. But they both do similarly well with physics and stuff like that. They're both based off work. Yeah. yeah, also another thing to know is the HER is a much shorter forecast. So that might be another reason for that. All right, hey, thank you. No problem. Other questions out there? Okay, well, with that, I'd like to thank all of you for being on the call. I'd just like to comment that um, we will be sending you an email. It'll have a few things in it. It'll have a link to uh, Wyndham Lewis's paper that Jim mentioned earlier and which his presentation was based on. I'll also link you to the NCAR ensemble for those of you who may not be familiar with it. And finally, there will be a link to um, the location where you can go and download these presentations that we're going to put online. If you're able to have a look at them sometime and want to provide feedback um, either to myself or to Jim Steenberg directly, uh, I'm sure their group would really appreciate that. So uh, if there's nothing else, um, I don't know, Andy, if there's nothing else on your end, I think we're all set here.
No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.